Good evening. This is Joe Moses with the Photographic Historical Society of New England. I welcome all of you to another one of our presentations. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, if you are not already a member, please uh, go to our website, which will soon be replaced by the newer website and become a member only twenty dollars for the first year and uh, there's a lot of opportunities to learn new things about photography uh, i'm going to be handing the baton over to john felix now who is our new president and uh he will be handling the introduction responsibilities going forward Thank you very much, John. It's, it's a, always a pleasure working with you, and I hope you all enjoy the presentation this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. Um, first, one, first thing I want to say is uh, thank you um, for uh, handing the baton off to me. I'm, I'm quite honored to be able to be the president of, of FISNI. I'm quite thankful. Uh, to a number of people, uh, Marty Jones, uh, who put the nomination uh, ballot together. Um, she did a great job and I have some great people, a few new people on the board, uh, Sid being one and girl Ben uh, is another. So I'm really looking forward to working with them. But most of all, I, I wanna thank Joel. Um, you know, uh, I, I kind of joked, uh, but it's, it's half serious this morning during the board meeting when I said, I thank God that I was not the president the last two plus years. Um, that was really challenging. Uh, we had a website hacked into and that was taken away. Um, we had the pandemic. Uh, we learned that our usual ven venue for a photographic show was taken away and then it was canceled altogether. Um, major hits and, and Joe was able to, to navigate us through all of that. And uh, he did a great job, but I was I was just happy that he was in charge uh, that during that period rather than myself. But I really do thank him. I learned an incredible amount from Joe over the last two years serving as vice president, and I'm really looking forward to uh, to, to working with everybody uh, in the future. So with that, I think I'll just hand it over to Dana. Thank you, John. Um, Welcome everyone. Um, before I introduce tonight's presenter, just a few housekeeping things. Uh, please stay on mute while the presentation is going on. And um, we're going to have you type your questions into chat, which is at the bottom of your screen. You'll see a little speech balloon and that's chat. Um, type your questions in there to everyone, which is the default so we can all see them. And when we have a breathing uh, space, I will stop and uh, ask Lev the question that you posed. And at the end, we'll catch up with any other questions. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna summarize Bonnie's article for those of you who didn't get snapshots. Uh, Lev Sakin is a Soviet born and educated optical ed engineer and optical systems designer. Uh, before emigrating to the U.S., he worked for more than 15 years at the Optomechanical Corporation, LOMO, in Leningrad as an optical systems designer. He's been involved in the development of a wide variety of systems with many applications, including military and commercial use, microscopes, telescopes, submarine periscopes. One of his achievements was a design of the lens for the Russian camera LOMO Compact. In the US, he's worked for uh, General Scientific Corporation and SVG. And with a partner, Saken launched Optical Designs Associates Incorporated, an engineering consulting company in 2003. ODA provides optical design, mechanical design, optical engineering, and fabrication services for high tech companies, R&D laboratories, and government contract companies. The company holds over 40 US and foreign patents and has published numerous technical papers. I won't list the patents, uh, but you can follow the links in the chat for more information about LEV and ODA and LOMO. 
And uh, Lev, it's all yours. Welcome and take it away. Okay, guys. Thank you very much, Diana, for your presentation. Um, you know, myself, introduction of myself. And um, yes, my name is Lev Seikin and uh, I'm an optical designer by education. Um, so I work as, optical, as an optical designer for more than how many years? 45 years, a lot of years. <laughs> okay, so today I'm gonna present, um, uh, make my presentation about the history of Lomo compact camera and my involvement of, of the development of the lens for this camera. It's a rather unusual situation here because the, the majority of auditorium there are collectors of uh, photographic equipment and, and uh, cameras. I am not the collector, I am the optical designer. So what unites us, it's a history. So that's what my presentation will be about. <clears throat> now let me share the screen first and uh, I'll start. Okay, you see my screen now? Yeah? Okay. Um, so, how can I get rid of this stuff? Okay. Uh, I call <clears throat> I call this presentation introduction to basics of optical design and the history of the Lomo compact camera lens. Um, so, <clears throat> the first one chapter it's called "The Baby Was Conceived." As in 1981, a Japanese compact camera Casino CX2 was the inspiration of the Russian Lomo LCA camera. And um, by that time, um, Lomo uh, was producing a lot of uh, uh, a large spectrum of different photo and cinema cameras, including TTL cameras and cameras with independent lens and viewfinders. And Vladimir, a uh, few, few weeks ago, he made his presentation about the history of LOMO. And uh, you would see the, um, a lot of cameras he presented there. Among them was LOMO compact cam camera as well. <clears throat> so, um, a general, sorry, General Igor Krasinski in 1981, um, who was the right hand uh, of the USSR Minister of Defense, uh, introduced the camera, a Casino camera, a Japanese camera, to the desk of the that time uh, general director of LOMO. His name was Michael Panfilov. And Michael Panfilov was a very famous, outstanding director, which I've known personally. And uh, he was an exceptional man. He died probably 20, 25 years ago. So why General, the military man, presented this camera to the actually uh, civilian? Because um, Lomo, belong to a Ministry of Defense. It was a um, close society, I would close in a, a, you know, factory. And in order to work there, you had to have clearance because 60% of LOMO production was for military purpose and about 40% for civil use. And military production involved uh, very sophisticated by that time optical devices such as um, submarine periscopes, um, missile sites, uh, and you name it. All, you know, uh, by that time, all the outstanding, all the sophisticated optical devices produced by LOMO. Okay, that's why the um, actually uh, uh, general presented the, the his find of this, uh, Casino camera, and he suggested to 
um, Mr. Panfilov to produce this camera in a large quantity uh, and in which the whole society would laugh. So, <clears throat> um, so the, the next chapter called How the Minotaur One Was Dubbed. Minotaur One was the lens uh, for this camera. Why it's called Minotaur? Because uh, the first design has been made by Mr. Tarabukin and designer from uh, State Optical Institute in St. Petersburg. It's called Goye. And uh, he was the head of uh, laboratory in this State Institute and um, he designed this camera with some help. So it called Minitar because Mini stands for small and Tor stands uh, for three letters of his surname, Tarabukin. Um, what was the relationship between the Lomo and Goya? Uh, the specificity of this relationship, uh, both enterprises, was such that in many cases, the theoretical development of uh, Goye State Optical Institute were transferred to LOMO for their practical implementations. And in this case, the role of LOMO was uh, reduced to development of technological and production processes necessary, necessary for the material embodiment of Goye developments. And that's exactly what happened with this uh, uh, lens. So the necessary documentation was transferred to LOMA and within a short time, preparations were made for the mass production of the lenses. Uh, soon, experimental batch was made and the first copies of camera were sent to customers. The test results were not long in coming and they were unsatisfactory. So uh, two main reasons Um, why customers complain about this camera. It was insufficient resolution in the periphery areas of the frame and severe darkening at its edges. Another problem was that uh, this lens used extremely expensive glasses, one of the components of which was the rare earth metal lanthanum, the production of which was limited to several deposits in Asia, South and North America, and partly in Russia. That is in addition to the high price of lens, which negatively affected its price, there was a problem of providing the requirements amount of glass for mass production of cameras. So the solution of this problem problems was entrusted to me. Um, before proceeding directly to the discussion of the history of the creation of the lens for the Lomo compact camera, I would like to dwell on some aspects of optical design. And um, I will tell you why you will understand why I'm doing that because I'd like you to be aware of the, of the problems which optical designer faces when he start doing optimizing of this uh, of the um, optical systems. So the task was uh, uh, I was faced with to reduce the cost of the lens so as to keep it within the required price budget, increase resolution and increase illumination at, at the edges. So in what frame I was put? So it was necessary to make an improvement for the same conceptual optical scheme, the same number of lenses, the same lens shape, the same focal length, the same position of the aperture stop. There were two reasons for this. The camera was already in production, mechanical design ready, 
as well as toolkit for mass production and pattern pending. The project, the project was already announced and there was very little time for, for the redesign. <clears throat> so, um, So I would like you, as, as I said, to provide you with a highly, this highly qualified audience with some important aspects of optical design uh, while not over, overloading my presentation with hard to grasp scientific details. Basically, I will focus only on the most general parameters required for the design of optical systems. And these parameters are basic for optical systems of any complexity and various applications. Without them, it is impossible to understand the main characteristics of optical systems and their importance. I believe that clarification, the relationship between the fundamental parameters of optical systems will help users to use them more efficiently. efficiently. So, sorry, effectively. Uh, so, <clears throat> Uh, basically, I'm going to discuss three parameters, luminosity, resolution, or resolving power, and focal length. I believe you're all familiar with these uh, 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 parameters. The first luminosity. Luminosity of optical system is the bandwidth of the lens, and luminos luminosity shows the maximum amount of light that can pass through the lens and hit the camera sensor. Sometimes, instead of luminosity, the term aperture ratio is used. In this case, the semantic value of the luminosity is a more applied nature. The term, the term aperture ratio expresses the ratio of the brightness illumination of the Im image to the re with respect to the brightness of the object. The aperture ratio of the optical system is pro a proportional to the square of the numerical aperture, and you know the terminal and numerical aperture. And consequently, an increase in luminosity of the system is associated with increase of the ENA. And the ratio of the, I'll, I will use another uh, uh, term, which you're familiar with, it's called the ratio of the entrance pupil diameter to the focal length of the optical system. And it's called F number. Or well, sometimes uh, uh, people in photography call it F stop. Now, this picture presents uh, how the uh, actual illumination, luminosity depends on the lens diameter and <clears throat> focal length of the optical system. You see, these are uh, uh, aperture stops with different F numbers here. And you see the, the, how the uh, illumination of the, uh, of the pictures uh, changes with respect to the uh, F numbers of the lens. <clears throat> the second term I'm gonna discuss, it's called <clears throat> F number in numerical aperture. So the figure shows a lens of clear aperture D. This is the D, a radius R. <clears throat> so, um, and uh, the lens collected light from the source and focuses at the focal plane over here. And the alpha, this is the angle, angle which associate with numerical aperture. Actually, the numerical aperture, it, it call, it's, it's um, defined by N, reflective index times sine of this angle alpha. <clears throat> and it's obvious that increasing D or decreasing the F allows to capture more radiation. It means the alpha becomes larger with increase of diameter of the lens or shortened with the <clears throat> focal length of the lens. So the F number concept puts these two together to allow quick comparison optics. So the small F number, the greater radiant flux collected by the lens. 
So the first conclusion is to use the camera in a wide range of illuminations, it is necessary to have a large on A, small f number of the lens. This conclusion is directly con related, related to the re resolution of the lens. So resolution, resolving power is ability of optical instrument to produce separate images of two objects very close together and it's called resolving power. You see the three pictures here. In one picture, two images completely resolved. In the second picture, two images somehow resolved. And the third picture, images not resolved at all. <clears throat> so the, this, the picture in the middle presents the limitation of the resolution of the camera of the lens. It's called Rayleigh criterion. And you see the pictures here. This is fully resolved, two images. This is just resolved, and this is not resolved. And I said, as I said, the Rayleigh criterion determined the lim limiting resolution of the lens. You see the two pictures here, the, the um, Christmas tree, right? <laughs> so on the left hand side, you see uh, the poor resolved image and the right hand side, you see good resolved image. <clears throat> so the resolution of this case described with this formula, R, which is the minimal distance between the resolved points, smaller minimal distance, higher resolution. So in this equation, you see <clears throat> that resolution depends on the lambda, which is wavelength of the light and Na. So in order to get R smaller, you have to reduce either lambda wavelength or increase Na. And also this expression can be expressed in um, F number or diameter of the lens D and focal length. So the second conclusion is, increasing resolution requires decreasing of the focal length and increasing the lens diameter. And that's exactly the same conclusion which was for the luminous, uh, uh, illumination of the system. I mean, the, the lens to get the more flux coming through the lens. So the formula of the resolution valid for ideal optical systems, free of optical aberrations. And the presence of aberrations lead to decrease, to decrease in the resolution of the lens. And one of the main objective of optical design is to reduce this aberration as much as possible. There are an uh, infinite number of optical aberrations in nature. And um, the more complex optical system have, more aberration can, get, can, can be compensated for. We work with, the, with the Vladimir for the company and as, as Dan, Dana um, introduced me with, as the company is called Silicon Valley Group, or it, it, it's been bought the um, Dutch company SML later. And the company produce equipment for lithography, for computer chip production. And we design uh, projection objects there, which consist of 36 lenses. And the diameter of the lenses was 500 millimeters, half of meter. And the length of the optical system was 1.2 meters. So you, you imagine this column of optics, it's a huge. And uh, the cost of this uh, optical system cost more than $1 million. And uh, <clears throat> because we have to uh, make a very high resolution in this uh, optical system, because we have to resolve the features in order to 
to place millions of transistors in a very small area of the chip, you have to have huge resolution. And this resolution was 40 nanometers. So 40 times 10 to the minus nine meter. Can you imagine this small number? And this number is smaller, thousand times smaller than your hair. So in order to have this kind of resolution, you have to compensate for many, 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 many aberrations. And we did it for 64 aberrations, actually. We, we compensated this optical system, uh, designed it for 64 aberrations. So I'm not going to describe, of course, this all for this kind of, for this case, because we have relatively simple system, but I'm going to describe only four basic aberrations. And I, I'm sure you heard about them. It's spherical aberration, coma, astigmatism, and distortion. <clears throat> First, it's spherical aberration. So it's blurring of the image caused by spherical aberration is a result of the fact that ray passing at different heights of the lens are focused at different points of the, uh, on the optical axis. You see, this is the, the, um, the optical system. It's for simplicity, just simple lens, okay? Rays go through this optical system lens and focuses at one point. This is the case with no spherical aberration. However, if the system presents spherical aberration, you see the situation when the uh, outer rays focuses closer to the focus, and a race close to the optical axis focuses far from the, fo from the uh, focal point of the lens. So coma, blurring the image caused by coma is a result of oblique beam traveling at different lens heights, being focused at different points at the image plane. The same situation only for the, as for spherical calibration, only for the inclined beam. So you see the rays coming through the edge of the lens, focuses over here, and coming closer to the optical axis, focuses right here. So that what you see two situation. You see the symmetrical blurring, blurring of, the, of the image with the presence of spherical vibration and non-symmetrical blurring, blurring with the presence of coma. Of course, in the, in the real life situation, you have something mixture of them. Astigmatism. Astigmatism, an optical system with the astigmatism is one where rays that propagate in two perpendicular planes have different foci. So again, this is the, the lens, optical system. And we have two cuts, the vertical cut and horizontal cut. So the rays in the vertical cut focuses here. And the rays coming into horizontal cut plane focuses right here. The difference between two positions of foci for two different planes, orthogonal planes, it's called astigmatism. So what it does in, in a real system, if you have a cross with a vertical and horizontal line, at one focal position, you will see a sharp image of the vertical line, at another focal position, you have sharp image of the horizontal line. So when you have many, many surfaces in optical system, it's, a, it's a, a possible to compensate for astigmatism with different combination of material, I mean, glasses, thicknesses, and radio of the lenses. When you have a simple system, for instance, you have astigmatism on the, of your eye, right? And you prescribe the lens with a certain amount of astigmatism to compensate for astigmatism of your eye. So how it, it's done in this case, because you don't have too many surfaces, right? You have only two spherical surfaces in your lens, eye lens, right? And not eye lens, but the glass. So uh, what, what, what people do, they just have uh, instead of spherical surface, they have toroidal surface, which has two different radii in two different orthogonal planes. In this case, you introduce astigmatism of, of different sign to your astigmatism of, of your eye glass, and you compensate for it. 
Another aberration, the last one is distortion. Distortion is aberration is manifested by changes in the shape of the image rather than sharpness or color spectrum. So you can have perfectly sharp image, but it would be distorted. It means the proportion of, uh, proportion of this uh, image would be different from proportion of the object. And, it, and that's the, exactly the case. You see the three cases here. One is no distortion. You see that image proportional to the object. And you have two distortions. One is called this kind of shape called pincushion distor pin distortion. Another one is called barrel distortion. distortion. And that would have two images look like with the presence of barrel distortion and pincushion distortion. And this is the most difficult aberration to, uh, aberration to correct. That's why usually in a system like uh, photocamera lenses with a few lenses, wide angle lenses actually uh, had much more lenses than lenses used for photo cameras just for, for normal purposes. Because you have to have some leverage to compensate for distortion. So control, oops, sorry. So control of result, do you hear me? Okay, because I, I hit the, the button, okay. Control of resolution of lenses are done by taking a picture of a special target and the resolution determined visually by de defining the part of the target, the strokes of which are seen resolved. For instance, you have a target number two, right? Number three, four, five, six, and et cetera. You have and the small one, you know, four, five, it, whatever, right? So by calling the number, like like uh, this number, for instance, right? You know which resolution this number corresponds to. And usually the uh, it's described in 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 a um, millimeter per uh, no line per per millimeter. That's the definition of resolution in this case, lines per millimeter. So <clears throat> with the help of electronic and digital cameras, it's possible to eliminate to some extent detrimental effect of aberration, the reducing blur caused by aberrations, by clipping highlights in interpixel spaces and by reformatting the image scale. But for professional cameras where the requirements for image quality are much high, tighter, the problems of reducing aberration is very relevant also. Another problem <clears throat> we just discussed it with Joel, <clears throat> it's called vignetting. <clears throat> so vignetting is phenomenal of partial lim limitation uh, a darkening of oblique light beams by the lens frames and aperture stops of the optical system. The result is to decre decrease in image brightness toward the edges of the system field of view. Um, and it, in photographic, cinematographic, television and projection lenses, this manifests itself in the form of increased brightness of the central part of the frame in relation to its corner. And let me explain you why it happened. You see the picture here. <clears throat> so this is the central beam of the rays. So it goes through the lens and limited by the aperture stop right here. You see the upper ray and lower ray. When you have the uh, inclined beam over here, so the upper part of this limited by the rim of the lens and the lower part of it limited by the a rear, uh, a rim of the, of the second lens. So DNA, and they determined by this angle, this angle. This angle in one case, this angle in another case. You see the NAs are very different. And we know the larger NA, more light you can collect. So brighter picture will be. So in this case, you see that the central part of the picture is bright enough and the uh, periphery part of the picture will be much darker because DNA is much smaller. So 
The Minotaur, and this is the exact the picture of the Minotaur, the lens used in the Lomo Compact camera. And Minotaur is very small, a compact lens. You see the, the thickness of this lens only 10.2 millimeters here. There is no, usually the aperture stop in many cases located in between this, in this space right here, but there is no room for that because the lens, lens is very small. So the aperture stop uh, located behind the lens over here. And that the worsened situation with the so-called vignetting. So that's why the vignetting in a miniature lens, it means in a photo camera, um, Lomo Compact is very critical. And the picture looked like this. So the central part of the, this is picture uh, uh, taken exactly with the Loma Campia cam, comeback camera. So this is the central part of the picture bright, but the, the, the corners very dark because the vignetting is huge there. It's more than, I would say more than 80%. It means the, the amount of light for the central port of this, uh, in this camera, it's all, it's a uh, eighty percent. Let's say it's hundred percent, right? So the only twenty percent the amount of the light for the periphery of these uh, uh, coming through uh, to the to the edges of the image over here. Okay, and um, so that's exactly what happens here. The central part is, is bright, and periphery is dark. <clears throat> Okay. So, <clears throat> uh, when, um, you know, uh, so when, when the um, Mr. Tarbukin designed the camera, it's got obvious some problems with the, with this camera. And basically the problems were that the original objective had a good resolution at the center of the field of view up to 35 lines per millimeter and very poor, about 10 to 12 lines at the edge of the field of view. And the poor lighting at the edge of the field of view due to the significant vignetting, this was very critical. So when the first cam camera was, was in, I, introduced to the public, it was a lot of critics because the um, uh, people found that the resolution at the edges, specifically with the light illumination of the edges were insufficient. And also <clears throat> the other problem was that Original lens used expensive heavy glasses containing the rare earth metal lanthanum, which exceeded the budget of the camera and raised the question of uninterrupted supply of glass to the lens. So strong vignetting caused a sharp darkening of the frame peripheries, which was aggravated by poor resolution of these zones. <clears throat> so at that time, I was a leader of metrology equipment development group and positioned myself as a developer of a unique method for optimizing optical systems. And um, my method was uh, based on a relatively simple algorithm for solving a system of one linear and one quadratic equations the variables of which were the parameters of the lens that do not affect their general configuration, such as shape, thickness, and materials. Uh, so when we first time, actually the lens was produced, original lens was produced, uh, which was designed by Mr. Tarbukin. And the first time it was introduced to the public, it was a lot of complaints about this lens. And actually it was a problem with supplying the, 
the glasses as well because they use so-called rare earth um, uh, glass containing metal and tannium. So I was called um, by the uh, chief of engineering of our uh, enterprise. And he told me, you know what? You claim you have a unique, me unique method of optimizing system. We have a big problem with the, um, uh, with the um, you know, a Lomo Compact camera. That's called the camera called Lomo Compact, which needs to be solved as soon as possible because the, the, the camera, camera is production already. We have a lot of orders. So we need to help. And um, so he described me what the, uh, what the uh, problem we have, they have. And he said, you know what? You claim you have unique method of optimizing the lenses, uh, which was, uh, you know, I presented to him because he was, he was the, um, uh, uh, what do you call this, a scientific leader, of, scientific advisor of my dissertation. And he said, you can, uh, you, you claim you can do that. So I'll give you a very short time to improve the lens and improve the performance and, and, and um, uh, possibly to uh, get rid of these very expensive glasses. <clears throat> so in about a week, something, maybe about two weeks, I presented a new design in which all the shortcomings of previous one had been eliminated. Namely, the resolution of the center had been reduced to quite acceptable level of 20 lines per millimeter. Uh, if you remember, original was 35. So I have to redistribute the resolution of the lens, such as slightly reduce the resolution at, um, at the center of the lens, which was quite acceptable level. And uh, uh, to bring it up up to 20 lines, about two times better resolution than the age. And the customer complaints about poor image quality have stopped. So the original design uh, used expensive, heavy uh, glasses containing rare earth metal lanthan lanthan um, lanthanum. So I redesigned the lens using most common glasses, which made it possible to calculate its cost, which the budget of the camera and ensure uninterrupted supply of glasses. So this is what uh, the camera looks like. And these two lenses, the different colors, they're the same lens actually. So that was the lens I designed. So <laughs> I presented this lens in two weeks. It was uh, made uh, about a about month after I presented the lens. It was made the new lens and all complaints stopped. So after successful com completion of the whole epic, I asked the chief engineer why the lens, I mean, the, the, the chief engineer who was uh, actually asked me to help him, I asked him why the lens still uh, has a name Minotaur, um, uh, because I would I changed the Minotaur booking design. He said, you know, it's too late, too late to change something, because the name uh, already uh, it's, a, it's a trademark for this name was. So and he said, you know what? We'll give you the premium. So he, he gave me the premium at that time, eight hundred rubles. Imagine that my monthly salary was 250 rubles. So I got the premium about three times larger than my monthly, monthly payment. So that was the, was the story about this, um, um, this uh, Lomo Compact camera. And um, I'll give you one quote. <clears throat> the quote was from the uh, website, it's called Lomography. So, but there was a catch. The lens couldn't be mass product produced in a cost-effective manner and uncertainties arose. However, godness prevailed when a well-known and respected 
emeritus Lev Seikin took the reins. He, his recalculation of Minitra one made the Lomo LCA a successful endeavor. The Minitra lens was finished and the camera went into mass production in 1984. That was the story about my involvement in designing of this first compact camera produced in Russia. And this is the end of my, my presentation. Thank you. If you have some questions, please ask me. Thank you, Lev. No problem. That was wonderful. Um, the diagrams were great. I yeah. cannot claim to uh, have understood every single equation, but I appreciated the way that you illustrated the angles of the light and the dimensions of the lenses. Um, does anybody have any questions in the chat? I don't see anything just yet. I have a question that I would like to ask ahead, you. So what is the history of rare earth metals like lanthanum being used in optical glass? Was that from the beginning when cameras were produced or? Yeah, you know what? Uh, it's a very good question, by the way. When we design the lens, you have uh, usually a combination of different glasses. The groups are called crowns and flints. That's a group of the uh, um, optical materials, optical glasses. Uh, usually uh, crowns, they have um, low, they're low index glasses, low optical index glasses. And flints, usually they are high index glasses, okay? When you design the optical system, you have a combination of this flint and crowns because you have to compensate for many, like I said, aberration in the system, right? It's called monochromatic aberrations and polychromatic aberration because you have to render good lighting, good coloring in each lens. You see, to, to make it vivid, not like unusual colors. So optical design is very sophisticated in this case, and it uses a lot of different glasses. So, the variety of glasses used to be like hundreds of different glasses. And the, uh, the task for optical design was uh, uh, choose the right combination of glasses. So if you have, uh, you know, ability, if you have luxury to create a big system and having many, 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 many lenses, you, you have variety to pick up for many, many glasses. It's actually, helps you because you have to compensate for a lot of aberration. You, you would have ability to compensate for a lot of aberrations. For color aberration, monochromatic aberration, you have to have the image, realistic image. Otherwise you would produce something, you know, you wouldn't recognize yourself or somebody you, 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 take, you take a picture of, right? So, <clears throat> um, Um, and also, like like your question was, uh, you you should you should pick up the uh, proper combination of different glasses because you have to compensate for a lot of aberration in optical system. Okay, it's it's rather complicated to explain everything, but in still in simple terms, you have you have uh, option to pick up very expensive glasses, and. Uh, don't work too much on optical design, optimizing the system, because glasses would help. Or you have to have, you, you have to pick up relatively uh, simple and cheap glasses, but you have to do a lot of work in order to, to get a good performance of the lens, okay? So I believe the, uh, the, the first designer of the lens, Mr. Tarbukin, he picked up most expensive glasses, because it's much easier to, to, to do the optimization of the system, optical optimization. And he didn't spend much time or whatever, his, maybe his program, he, he didn't have good algorithm to do that. I don't know the history of that. And he designed good lens, relatively good lens. 
However, it was very expensive. And the, the problem with this, uh, uh, this rare metal, uh, the, the um, not too many uh, sources to get it, and it's also expensive. And usually uh, this kind of cameras, which uh, Lomo Compact is, they are usually uh, should be low budget cameras. But so if you, <clears throat> you know, produce a lens with a very expensive glass, you wouldn't get the budget of the, for the lens, okay? So I was able to pick up just normal glasses, which are inexpensive glasses, get rid of these very expensive uh, lanthanum glasses, it's called, right? And uh, I got a good camera, good performance of the lens. Thanks to you and yeah. cheap, cheap glass and love formula. <laughs> Yeah. for success. There's a few more questions. I'm going to go in sequence in the chat. Um, when did you first realize the lens was becoming popular with users? It's from Ben. You know what? Everything, you know, um, ends with the money, right? So we, when, when, when we started selling the cameras, and it was a huge amount of cameras were sold, actually, because the uh, Japanese camera was a good one, but it was very expensive. Um, so we got a lot of customers, plus, uh, you know, inside of the country, because it was the first comeback camera, actually. And it was uh, this camera right here, right here. Do you see me? If you're in um, speaker view audience, it's, it's easier to see the cameras. So in view, choose speaker. Yeah, this is the first camera. That's the first compact camera in the USA. A uh, USSR, I'm sorry, USSR in Soviet Union. So um, the lens is very small. You see that this is the lens right here. And it's a very compact camera and it's relatively good performance camera. I tell you, I still, it's still in working condition. I have it, condition I have it, yeah. Can you show it one more time? Hold it up a little higher. Thank you. Yes, thanks. Okay. So actually, this is the first compact camera in, in the history of USSR. Let's see, more questions. Um, Sid is wondering how the design got approved in the first place if there were so many problems. You know what, the relationship between this uh, State Optical Institute, which was uh, this land design for first time, uh, was like, uh, they, they, they would always be superior of our organization, which I will work for LOMA. LOMA stands for Leningrad Optomechanical Corporation. Okay. And in many cases, we got designs from this uh, state institute uh, because it was, uh, it was a lot of scientists there. It was a lot of 3,500 people there, scientists. Though in Loma was about 10,000 people, but we are production base for, for optical industry. So usually they, they made, we may design ourselves as well, but they, the relationship was like, like, like a father and a child, okay? So they would uh, dictate us sometimes what to produce and how to produce. So they, they de de deliver designs to us and we just uh, try to adapt this design to production because sometimes their design wasn't good for production because they were like theoretical kind of base uh, Actually, versus, versus to our like production base. Yes, Larry's question sort of is about that. He wants to know, can you calculate the resolution of a camera lens by formula before physical production, or is the resulting resolution a trial and error process from testing lenses after a prototype is made? Well, they, they deliver documentation to us. We made prototypes and we made production. So of course we, you know, analyze their designs because we had capabilities to do that. We had optical programs, we knew the people there, so we, 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 do, we belong to the same, the, the same, the same ministry. It was uh, defense, uh, defense ministry, defense ministry organization. So we, we belong to the same organization, the same ministry. And uh, uh, 
so we knew people there. And so when they de delivered to us some designs, it, not only for, for photo lenses, some other designs as well. So we had department with analyze design and try to adapt the design to production because sometimes their design designs were unproductive because something, you know, <laughs> Production and theoretical things is uh, two different things. And sometimes you have to, you have to usually, in many cases, in, in majority cases, you have to adapt design to the production because you have to have to product the, 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 the optical devices, not only to um, design them, right? So <clears throat> the first they, they delivered the lenses to that looked okay from design standpoint. But when we started produ producing these lenses, we realized that a lot, we realized that was a lot of complaint, complaints from the customer because the center part of the lens was good, high resolution, but the, um, um, you know, uh, rear parts, I mean, the, the corners of the lens and the uh, off center of the part of the lens were not good because resolution wasn't good enough. Plus the um, illumination due to the vignetting of this lens, so, you know, much less light comes to the edges of the lens of the of the of the picture. So, and the situation getting worse because the uh, this part was dark and plus not enough resolution. Yeah, there's a question from Fred. Um, do you know if anyone has created lens elements that have different glass material in the center than the periphery? And could this potentially create a lens that needs less elements? Very good question. I I know it were attempt attempt to do that, but it it wasn't a very good idea because you have to make the lens right, and the lens usually mold it from the glass right, and then it's be going to production line, being polished, being uh, fine polishing, rough polishing of the lens right. So um, there are some attempts to do this, uh, but uh, as far as I know, it was very expensive to do that. And uh, I wouldn't say it, it was good for mass production. Okay. Um, Kenneth asks, uh, some camera lenses are favored for the out of focus space in a picture like portraiture. Um, could you discuss this? Say it again, I, I misunderstood it. Oh, some camera lenses are favored for the out of focus uh -huh. in, in an application like portraiture, uh -huh. vignetting and, and sort of mm -hmm. soft focus. Would you please discuss this? How did that affect your design? You know, the portrait lenses, sometimes they intentionally introduce some aberration there, like spherical aberration. But, you know, they, 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 they introduce it there because you know, sometimes people, uh, some people's skin, uh, skin, or especially not very young people, they have some defects, right? So when you have a sharp image, the picture won't be very good. So sometimes uh, you intentionally introduce some aberration in the system, like uh, like spherical aberration in the system, to get smooth the uh, face features, especially for portrait lenses. So. That's why, um, so it's kind of trick. You, you, you have to know the application of the lens you're designed for. We've got a bunch more questions and it's approaching 8.30. So I'm gonna try and <laughs> go through these quickly. Um, ben asks, what is the difference between the Casina CX2 film camera in the beginning and the Lomo LCA? Uh, I tell you the truth, I never saw the picture from made by Casina. I know by the, that Japanese camera is usually very good. Uh, I know that the first um, samples of Lomo Compact with the uh, original lens weren't good. And there was a lot of complaints from, from the customers. In Russia, it was impossible that time, Soviet Union, it was impossible to buy some foreign lenses for foreign cameras because uh, it was nothing to compare with actually you have to live with something but you have to rely on the on the customer's responses and response wasn't good so that's why i would say 
Casino was and is a very good company producing the lenses. We didn't have much experience with that. That was the first camera we produced. And um, as I said, the, uh, the first experience wasn't good. It was a lot of complaints. After I presented my design and it was implemented and was manufactured, so all complaints were eliminated. And so the camera was very good. And actually the company, the society, it's called Lomography, right? Was based on this uh, Lomo Compact camera. Sid is asking, did you use any special coding to increase the overall transmission? No, that's a very good question, by the way. No, it was just a... Uh, 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 you know, normal standard coding. Uh, for these cheap cameras, we don't use very, coding is a very expensive procedure, I tell you. Sometimes coding is as much expensive as the lens itself. Because the coatings, in order to increase uh, transmission in the lenses with a good color rendering. So you have to have very sophisticated coatings. It's multi-layer coatings. And these coatings are very expensive. So uh, the, the, the answer is uh, we don't use special coatings because it was cheap camera, amateur camera. So we use just normal coatings. Usually coatings have, it's called layers, more sophisticated coatings, more layers you have. It's thin films, it's actual thin films and layers. So usually we have one or two layer coatings in this kind of lenses. Reich uh, asks, are plastic, len are plastic lenses approaching the resolution of glass lenses? Plastic lenses have uh, two major drawbacks. Uh, plastic doesn't have a variety of indices, optical indices, because in order to create good performance, you have to have uh, optical indices of the lens, of the, of the, of the glasses. You know the index, what is the index? Uh, optical index of the lens. Okay, I don't want to. <laughs> okay, anyhow. So the lens, why we have so many different glasses? Like cattle have 100 glasses. Uh, the glasses are different by, by optical indices. Okay? And these indices try to uh, help you to create a very good performance. That's why you, you, you should see, you know, picture taken by the by the lenses like 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 vivid pictures right like the pictures of a real person right plastics material don't have many indices and the you, and you have to have a big range of the indices that's why you call this flint and crowns that the definition of different optical glasses it's called flint group and crown group okay these two groups differ by indices and dispersion. One of the parameters you use is called dispersion. Dispersion helps you to make the color correction of the lens, okay? Because you can make a very good monochromatic image, but when you do the color, you have to have what's called dispersion of the lens, okay? It means different indices for different colors, okay? okay? Plastic doesn't have this ability, plastic. They usually have very limited number of indices, very limited range of indices, and very limited range of dispersion. That's why usually good lenses do not have plastics. Yes. They use glasses. Okay, thank you. There are two more questions. How are we doing for time, Ben? I think we're right on track, Dana. So um, okay. um, I'd be happy to stay on for a few minutes uh, after to, for anyone to exchange pleasantries. And uh, I think we're right on, right on try. Okay, well, two quick more questions for Lev. Bill asks, uh, when producing the lens, how did you test each experiment? Did you have to expose film or was there another way? You expose the target like, like I showed you. The target usually for photographic lenses, you it's many, 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 many uh, methods to um, estimate the performance of the lens. The simplest one, which used for usually for cheap photographic lenses, to shoot the target with film. 
Uh, yeah, the target, like I showed in my presentation, the target, right? right. And you see the visual, uh, how many lines, what the feature resolved. You can see the separate lines, horizontal and vertical. So that what you uh, qualify the lens performance by shooting the target. And what kind of film were you using to Just shoot? Just normal the... film. Yeah. Normal film. Okay. Uh, it's, by the way, it's a good question because you have uh, very sensitive films and less sensitive films. They sometimes, uh, not now, now, you know, companies produce very good uh, films, but, uh, but in the early days, a high sensitivity film, they have a, um, it's called high grain films. So the structure was high grain and that's why sometimes you wouldn't see good resolution because the resolution would be limited not by the camera lens, but by the film. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So you have to shoot the target and actually the, uh, do the development, uh, developing of the film and see how many lines you resolve. Okay, thanks. And uh, last question from Larry. Uh, the lens on the Olympus XA1 was designed to be physically shorter than the effective focal length. Does your lens also do something like that? Okay, this was called a telephoto lens. <laughs> How to explain it to you. Um, I, <laughs> so telephoto lens, um, okay. Let's put it this way. This lens is sometimes shorter than its focal length. So the lens, usually an optical lens defined by the focal length of the lens, right? So sometimes you, you, you should see the short focal length and the, and the large focal length lenses, right? So for instance, for microscopes, you use very short focal length lenses, right? Mm -hmm. uh, for for uh, like, uh, what do you call these uh, lenses uh, used in the camera, like, like uh, for shooting like uh, uh, four objects, right? Use, use, it's called, uh, it's called, I forgot the name of it. So you use a, a long focal length lens, right? So, um, sorry, what's your question again? Um, the lens on this Olympus XA1 was designed to be physically shorter than the effective focal length. Okay, yeah. Does yours do the same thing? That's why the, the it's called, you know, the principal plane of the lens, you know, it's hard to explain it to you. So anyhow, so the lens is made shorter than its focal length. So that's why it, it's a special trick. It's called, um, um, I forgot the, 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 the name of it, but anyhow, each lens, uh, have created its principal plane. In the lens, it's called the principal plane. Usually the principal plane of the lens, you can, okay, you can present the lens in a simple way. Instead of depicting all, you know, all the physical lenses here, you can present this at two principal planes, just, just as, as simple lines, okay? And light goes one principal plane and being refracted and go through another principal plane. Principal plane is just a, just a line, just a plane, right? Reich, so um, Reich says is a retro focus lens. Yeah, retro yeah. focus is the term. Retro focus lens and being the principal plane of this lens far from far away uh, from this lens. It, it, it goes before the lens. That's what's called a retro focus lens. Its principal plane is outside of the lens. Usually principal planes of lens inside of the lens. That's what it's called Cello photo lens, right? Okay. Sorry, maybe, you know, I'm not very clear, but but it's it's hard to explain sometimes. I have to depict something, but I don't have this capability, unfortunately. No, I, I appreciate, I, I'm trying to picture the diagram in my mind. <laughs> I'm not always good at that. Um, and one last thing Sid said, is Lev trying to explain the effect of looking at a telescope backwards? Telescope backwards. Um, essentially, you can introduce 
each optical system with just two principal planes. I don't have capability to write uh, something down, otherwise you would, I would explain it. But imagine you have two planes, two planes. So light coming into the lens, which introduced by, by two planes, forget about lenses, two planes. It's called principal planes, right? They're usually inside of the lens, right? So light comes through one and then being refracted, going to the second principal plane and refracted again and goes out and hit the image plane, okay? So instead of having many, 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 many different lenses, you can introduce each optical system with two planes, which are called principal planes of the lens, where diffraction occurs on these two planes. And you can replace each optical system with these two planes. It's called front and rear principal planes. That's it. So, Um, again, what's the question? Oh, um, what's his question? Uh, Larry said that the the lens on the Olympus camera, the XA1, was designed to be physically shorter than the effective focal length. Because the principal plane of this lens, usually principal planes are inside of the lens. But you can design the lens that the principal plane outside of the lens, because all refraction actually occurs on the principal plane. You can replace the whole lens with the principal planes, two principal planes, forget about glass. So the light, go, light goes through this, uh, into the system, which hit the first principal plane and then hit the second principal plane. If you put the principal plane outside of the lens, so it means that the light hit the principal lane a plane before it goes into the real glass. That's the trick of the design. It's called a retro focus lens. Okay. It's uh, hard to explain sometimes. No. I, 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 should have, I should have depicted for you. No, my question was, Olympus did this to make the camera very thin. Did, did you do a similar trick for your camera and lens? No, uh, he does it see because he had retrofocal focal, focal plane lens, right? So it means the principal plane of this lens outside of the real glass. Because all refraction occurs on the principal plane of the lens. The usually, uh, the, 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 the classical principal pre, uh, lens has two principal planes, the first one and the second one. So you can replace all glasses with two principal planes. The light goes in the first principal plane, hit it, being refracted, hit the second principal plane and being reflected. So you have to mimic the whole lens with just two principal planes, okay? But when the lens is thick, you have two principal planes inside of the lens. When you have to, if you wanna make a lens thin, you can, put the principal plane outside of the principle of the lens. And in this case, the heat being, being occurred on the uh, principal plane before it hit the glass. In this case, you can make the glasses very thin by uh, putting the principal plane outside of the lens. That is called retrofocal plane lens. Thank you. I yeah. sorry, sorry, it's hard to explain sometimes because you know terminology, it's you know, it can get rid of terminology sometimes. <clears throat> no, I will I'm gonna if you find an illustration of this, can you send it yeah. to me and I will post it? Esse essentially what you can do instead of putting the lens like you know, many, 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 many different lenses, you can replace the lens with the two planes two planes like this. So the lens come in, hit the one plane, change the trajectory, hit the second plane and change the trajectory and hit the, 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 the image plane, that's it. Yes. So you can replay the whole various, uh, uh, you know, complex lens with the many, many, many lenses with that two planes. It's called principal planes of the lens. Thank you. So usually, as I said, these principal planes are inside of the lens. 
and lens being thick. But there is some trick to put the principal plane outside of the lens by design. And in this case, the light hit the principal plane before it hit the lens. So in this case, you just, you know, safe in the glass. You, you, make, you can make the lens much thinner than its focal plane, its focal length. Okay, I was just asking, you're making this much more complicated. I was just asking, did you do a similar trick? The answer is no. Your planes no. are inside the lens. No, correct? no, 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 no. In our case, no, no. It just, uh, it just was a very thin lens. Okay, that's Classical the lens okay. with the two principal planes inside of the lens. Okay, that's the answer. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. That's okay. Oh, thank you. Um, all right. Um, that concludes our questions for Lev. Um, and uh, usually at the end, Lev, we have just a few minutes where everyone unmutes and sort of chats for a bit. Mm -hmm. I also want to mention that uh, next month, please join us for uh, sure. Terry, Terry Capucci, who mm -hmm. is uh, an alternative process photographer and who is um, preserving a large collection of glass plate negatives. She was mentioned in the October snapshots issue. Okay. So you can see a, a brief article on Terry there. She'll be our presenter on February 6th. Sure. Usually, how do, you, how do you do that? Usually you send invitations to this presentation? Yes. You have a free membership to FISNI for a year as a presenter. Thank so you. we will be, you should receive all of all of our invitations. Perfect. So Thank we're, we're thrilled to have you. Thanks a lot. So if anybody, everybody would like to unmute, we can give Lev a round of applause. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you. It was a pleasure, a big pleasure to me to talk to professionals. Thank you. <laughs> Thank Thanks you. Bye-bye. Uh, Dana, can I ask you, it was the December program, which I wasn't able to uh, attend uh, on Zoom. Was that posted on the FISNI website? Because I looked a while back and I couldn't find it unless I was looking at the wrong place. It's on our YouTube channel. You know, if have you... Ben, if you have a link to that, could you stick it in the chat? Thanks. Yeah. Um, there's a YouTube channel that archives all of the presentations. So if you go to YouTube and just search for Disney, you should find the channel. And that's where all the, it takes a, a little bit to process them after they're recorded. So that's where you'll find them. Thanks to Ben. Thank you, Ben. I just sent a link in the chat too. So uh, great. Uh, we're looking for more subscribers for our Disney channel too. So if anyone goes to YouTube and can subscribe, uh, you'll get all of our uh, our new releases. Yes, and um, at the beginning of the chat, if you scroll all the way up, there are links uh, about Lev's uh, company, ODA Optics, and the history of lamography at the top. So. Um, Thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you, John. Thank you for putting these together. And thank you, Joel, for your service. Dana and Ben for putting so much effort into these presentations. I appreciate it. Yeah, Dana, if I could just mention the March presentation with Eric Luden of Digital Silver Imaging is going to be a monstrously good success. He's probably the top expert on copying old images reasonably and quickly. So... Uh, I think that uh, uh, Eric Luden and his company is Digital Stilva Imaging in Belmont. He's an absolute pioneer. And if one had images uh, that they would like to preserve at a very high quality, uh, he can do it. So what usually took two or three hours, he can do in 90 seconds with the same or better quality. So Eric's presentation in March is something that everyone should absolutely uh, save the time for. Thank you. Um, Is there going to be a swap meet one of these days? Sale? Um, that we, we don't have a definite word on that, do we, John, on Photographica? Um, not yet, no. Uh, we, all, all systems 
appear to be go. It looks like it's going to go. Mm -hmm. um, but with the unknowns that are involved with, with COVID, uh, we're still somewhat in a waiting mode. But we haven't gotten uh, any word from the town or anybody uh, for, saying that it's not going to go. So we're this was supposed to be in April, right? Yeah. If you read your snapshots, you'll see the dates. <clears throat> yeah. and any, dealer that, any dealer that's interested in, uh, in getting a table should contact John Dockery. <clears throat> Mark, are you, Mark, are you on the West Coast? I am. I'm in Oregon. Yeah, I know you from the Olympus uh, newsletter. Um, but uh, yeah, yes, our 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 show is in uh, in April. We're planning to do it uh, at the moment, uh, though always waiting for the town or the state or somebody to say no, it can't happen. Well, I hope it happens. Looking forward to come out for it. Hey. Uh, we're about eight fifty-one. Ben, how are you? How are we doing for time? Should we close things for the evening? Um, well, I think it's probably a good time to officially uh, close the meeting, but um, I'll I'll wait to really finally close it down in case anyone wants to stick around for another minute. So maybe we could uh, kind of close off the official business and everyone could say goodnight. And um, anyone who wants to stick around though for an extra you know minute or two to, to talk would be fine. Good night, all. Good night. Thank you, Ben, for everything. It was great. Thank you, Dana. Yeah, thanks, Dana. Thanks, Joel. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Good night, everyone.